Hey everybody at home at Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. Hope everyone's doing well today. Today is the continuing saga of Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel reviewing integrated amplifiers. We've got the big Cambridge Edge A integrated amplifier here and we're going to talk about it. So sit back and relax and we'll get started. Bridging past and pressing in the glow of autumn light. He holds the future gently like he held the past so tight in the old guy's hi fi. Everything feels right. So the Edge A is Cambridge Audio's top of the line integrated amplifier at $6,000. It was designed to celebrate Cambridge Audio's 50th anniversary, and it's named in honor of Professor Gordon Edge, who was Cambridge Audio's first principal designer back when the company first started in the late 60s. It is a beast of an integrated amplifier, weighs about 58 pounds, I think. It is rated at 100 by 2 into 8 ohms, 200 by 2 into 4 ohms. Um, just FYI, when Stereophile measured it, they got 145 into 8 ohms prior to clipping. They got 230 into 4 ohms prior to clipping. And then with a single channel driven at 2 ohms, they got 450 watts. So this thing has a lot of power on reserve. As a matter of fact, it can produce uh, almost uh, at peak 60 amps of current peak. Um, so a great deal of headroom in this amplifier. It has a frequency response of 3 hertz to 80, 80 excuse me, 80,000 hertz. Um, it does have some nice goes into and goes out. It does have a built-in DAC. Unfortunately, prior to my sitting down to film this, when I wrote the script, I couldn't actually figure out what DAC chip it was. If I do, I'll put it down here. It really doesn't matter. It's a very good implementation. And it has USB-B, and it will do 32-bit 384 and DSD-256 on that. And on the coax and tossling spitifs, it will do 2496. So really nice, simple, easy layout, beautiful piece. The remote only has a few buttons on it. So we've got power, we've got our volume controller, input selector, and headphones. So you rotate the input selector around to pick whatever input you want, and we'll talk about whatever the inputs are on the back side. And when we're done with that, I'm going to open it up. We're going to take a look inside and what do you see this thing. It's really kind of amazing. And then I'm going to come back and talk about how it sounds. So give me a second to get a couple of Teamsters down here to help me turn this thing around. <laughs> and we'll, we'll take a look at the back. We'll start over here. We've got our AC cord socket. We've got just a single pair of speakers. There's no multiple pairs of speakers on this. So our first set of binding posts. We have preamp out on single. We have preamp out on balanced. We also have a corresponding preamp out and on single and balanced on the other side. Balanced in, single ended in, and there's two of those. We have USB B on a, a USB type B. We have uh, HDMI arc, single ended toss link, and optical toss link, as well as Bluetooth and obviously our other pair of speaker binding posts. And then there's some control things here RS232, 9 pin for home automation and the like. So that's kind of a quick overview of the back panel of the Cambridge Edge A. And I'm gonna get those Teamsters back in here. We're gonna turn it around and then we're gonna go take a look at the inside and then I'll talk about how it sounds. Here we are looking at the inside of the Cambridge Edge A integrated amplifier. One thing I want you to notice is the huge toroidal power transformer. And actually there are two, there's one right underneath it. So it's dual mono in design. Remember Cambridge pioneered the use of toroidal power supplies back in 1968 on their very first amplifier. So they're pioneers in that. Now what they've done with these is they've stacked them out of phase with one another. So they cancel out, each one cancels out the other's energy. So if you remember back in the day when home theater was new and we still had tube TVs, you used to have to have a, a tube TV friendly speaker because otherwise the magnet would create all kinds of weird distortions on the screen of the TV. Well, they've applied what was called a bucking magnet. Well, there's a bucking magnet on the back of the speaker. So this magnet cancels out the magnetic force of this. So you could put it next to a CRT and it wouldn't distort the TV. It's still used for some things, but anyway, that's a bucking magnet. So basically that's kind of the concept with the two transformers stacked the way they are so that they cancel each other out. Each of these is 10,000 microfarads of 80 volt capacitor. So we've got uh, 40,000 microfarads per channel of capacitance. The other interesting thing too is the class XA design. Now, on screen, you'll see what a class A waveform looks like. Very pure, very clean. Transistors are always on. And remember, a class A amplifier, the power supply and the transistors run full out the whole time. 
right? The, the way you uh, control volume is you attenuate the input signal. Now, class AB amplifiers, you would put in the signal and attenuate the signal going in as well. But for the first maybe watt or two in most traditional class AB designs, the amplifier runs in class A mode and then it switches over to class B mode and you can see the waveform on the screen. The problem with class B mode is you'll see at the zero dB line there is what's called notch distortion or crossover distortion where one transistor hands off the signal to the other. As the transistors turn and off at that zero dB line it becomes very non-linear and that's where it starts to distort, distort. And as the other transistor starting to turn on, that's in its most non-linear region as well and so you get distortion. Well, class A eliminates that, but class A consumes a ton of power, creates a ton of heat. Class AB is very much more power efficient, but not sonically particularly good. So the idea behind a traditional class AB is we run, a, we run a couple of watts of class A, and as it gets louder, the volume of the music will, dis, will mask whatever crossover distortions occurred in the amplifier because we just become less sensitive to those kinds of things the louder the music gets. Well, for Cambridge, that really wasn't good enough. They wanted that class A performance and sound, but they didn't want the class A heat and power inefficiency. So they came up with class XA and it is proprietary to them. And it really is interesting. It was de developed by Doug Self at Cambridge Audio. And the, the usual class AB stage remains the same, but then they add a separate, the class XA stage, which provides an asymmetrical bias current to the output stage. You can see on the waveform there. What they do is they move the bias point up way above the way above or below the zero dB line. And this shifts the usual AB crossover point, class AB, to a higher level, effectively, any signal below that threshold is amplified without that crossover distortion, very much like a class A design. So really, simply put, the class XA amplification adds a voltage to traditional class AB design to shift that crossover point that you can see on screen out of the audible range and actually up into a spot where that distortion is not audible to us so that we really never get that crossover distortion at all. So it really is very fascinating. And the other interesting thing too is, this is a DC coupled design. There are no, these are power supply filter caps. There are no caps in the signal path at all. It is all DC servo controlled. There are multiple DC servos. What that means is, it reduces distortion, especially at low frequencies where caps tend to saturate and start to distort. Caps can be like microphones and power supply caps don't matter, but caps can be microphonic, like a tube could be microphonic. So, and also too with, uh, with DC servo, DC coupled, direct DC coupled, it's a much shorter signal path. So obviously there's less opportunity for interference to get into the signal. So it's really, really interesting. The other cool thing, and this is really amazing to me, very much like the Hegel, it has four complementary pairs, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, of, of their 200 watt each output transistors. And then you have the XA pair of output transistors down here. So it is a very, very powerful, very, excuse the expression, ballsy amplifier, um, quite, quite remarkable. Now that's the um, DAC board and I did find out it does use an ESS Sabre 9018 K2M DAC chip, which actually is one of the few Sabre chips I don't mind listening to at all. Very well implemented and so forth. Also too, it is full through hole construction and you will you can't see it, I'll try to insert a picture. Under here is another uh, toroidal transformer to run the preamp stage. Now on the input boards, you'll see some surface mount technology, but there's not much current there. That's just their input. So surface mounts fine on input. When you get to the output stage for the balanced and for the single ended, those are all through hole separate boards and they're tapped off their own power supply. Anyway, really remarkable, really well engineered, very elegant engineering on this, um, the Cambridge Edge A integrated amplifier. All right, let's button it up. I'm gonna go back in the studio, get a hernia moving this thing, and I'll tell you how it sounds if I can still talk. Well, you can see from looking inside the uh, Cambridge Edge A, it is very well constructed. It is really, really an engineering marvel. Uh, that class XA amplification circuitry is really fascinating and very interesting to nerds like me. So anyway, how did I test the unit? Um, well, I did, I threw everything I had at it that was good. I used it, I used this a lot when I did my review of the Triangle Magellan Duetta 40th $7,000 stand mount speakers. I used this a lot when I was doing my review of the, the Live Harmony DAC. 
Um, and I used it with all my other speakers, my Warfdales, my Elax, and my Energies. I used it with other sources. Everything digital was Artivana through either the Live Harmony deck, my Shit by Frost, or the Gishelli Daisy deck. For analog sources, I use my turntable, but because this doesn't have a phono preamp, I use the Cambridge Elva Duo phono preamp for both my moving magnet and my new moving coil cartridge, and it sounded very, very good, so it was excellent. I did also use the internal deck, the um, ESS 9018K2M. It's actually one of the only ESS decks that I really I'm okay listening to a lot. Um, doesn't sound bad at all. And so it did, it performed very well on all the sources I plugged into it. I used it mostly with the live, I used it mostly balanced and I used the live off of DDC. So I was mostly running I squared S into the live harmony deck. So again, good high end price appropriate gear. Um, and I listened to a lot of stuff. I probably had it for, I don't know, probably six weeks now. And um, I've been it's I've been driving this thing a lot. It's really a lot of fun to listen to, um, and so I went down a rabbit hole. I've listened to just about everything I can think of on this um, from a variety of different sources, from vinyl or digital. Um, really wonderful. But the standout recordings for me are a couple, and the, the, these three kind of stand out for me. This album by Mike and the Mechanics, called Mike and the Mechanics, it's his first album. It's Mike Rutherford from Genesis. It was a solo project he had, and it's really good. Just kind of early 80s rock and roll, kind of like Genesis, but a little bit more, a um, little less proggy than Genesis. Great vocalist, Paul Young, and Paul Carrick especially, great vocalist. Um, excellent, well-recorded. Uh, drums were mic'd up very well. Everybody was sounded great. Um, just a really good overall, very clean, very well-recorded studio album. Um, and just good rock and roll. My favorite track on it is Silent Running. I like that one a lot. To kind of figure out the imaging on this, and I'll give you the sonic character portion of it after I talk about the recordings. I use this recording from Sir Christopher Hogwood in the Academy of Ancient Music, Albanoni's Concertos, Opus 9, Concertos 1 through 12. And the cool thing about this recording is it was actually recorded at St. Jude on the Hill in Hempstead, London. It's an old, very old church. And so it has this unique sonic character to it. So, you know, churches are not like auditoriums. They're usually very long and narrow with very high ceilings, and they're all masonry inside. So very reverberate, very echoey. And they don't really do anything to dampen it down. I think they may mic everybody just a little bit closer, although they're not using a ton of mics. And I don't think in a church they can do the normal fan-shaped kind of orchestral seating arrangement. I think it's more kind of in rows and folks across an aisle from one another. Anyway, the image from that standpoint isn't a traditional classical one, but from a sonic standpoint, it's remarkable because you get all of that air and space inside that church is so well rendered. And again, I'll get into that a little more detail. But the fine details, micro details, this resolved all of those very, very well, especially on strings, mass strings. To get a little something different, I listen to this recording from Miles Davis, Someday My Prince Will Come. And it's a great recording from 1961. Of course, it was recorded at Columbia Studios' famous 30th Street the church, they called it, uh, recording studio. It was an old Armenian church that had been converted into a studio. And so it had high ceilings with very large space. And of course, back in 61, everybody was in the same room at the same time, all playing their instruments. And so they were all there when it was being recorded. It was not like someone was in a booth and the drummer came in on Tuesdays, you know, that kind of a thing, like modern stuff. So everybody's in the room. And I tend to gravitate toward recordings like that because you get a sense that Everybody can see each other. They can feed off one another. They're hearing themselves as if they were just jamming. And I think, you know, if you're playing something and Miles' face doesn't look like he's happy, then you maybe got to change what you're playing. But anyway, great group. You had um, Hank Mobley, Jimmy Cobb on drums. He's an amazing drummer. And his ride cymbal is just beautiful. Very well reproduced on this. Um, you had Coltrane on sax. You had uh, Paul Chambers on bass, that big bass of his. And he's the guy who played bass on, on So What on Kind of Blue. And then Wynton Kelly on piano and, of course, Miles on trumpet. Great recording. Very, very good. Excellent music, very approachable. It is kind of pop music with a bit of a jazz flair to it. It's much more popular and less improvisational. There is improv in it, but less improvisational, let's say, like kind of blue. So very, very good that way. So how did this thing do? Well, from the deepest bass to the highest highs, it did a super good job. It is got, you know, it's got 60 amps of current capability. It will dig deep and will just 
play the lowest bass note you can imagine and do it would never run out of steam. So bass was very good, excellent agility, very, you know, the timing was all right. There was never any tubbiness. There was never any, it never, you never felt like the bass was not right at the front edge of the note. You know, everything was right on time, right? I hate to use the phrase, but I, I kind of like it in this case, very good pace. Um, and again, it carries through all the way up into the upper bass, into the lower mid bass, um, you know, uh, Paul Chambers' bass was so well recorded. I mean, you could hear his fingers on the on the fretboard on the neck. You could hear those strings, you know, the big, especially the big E string. Just wonderfully well produced. All the way through the upper uh, mid bass into the lower mid range, male vocals were very, very good. Paul Carrick's vocals on My Kind of Mechanics were excellent. He's got a great voice. Um, they were very well reproduced. There was never any chestiness to it. It was never any, like, um, thinness to it. It was all just kind of very well fleshed out. Now, if there's any warmth in the amp, it's in that region into just kind of into the lower mid range and male vocal range. And some of the, you know, violas and, and some of those kinds of instruments that fall into that frequency response. As you got up higher through the mid range into the upper mid range and lower treble, the amplifier takes on this very clean characteristic. There's, it's not warm, it's not fatiguing, it's not bright, it's not hashy. It's just very clean, and I think it's very true to the source. I don't think it's like squeaky clean, sterile like the Orchard Audio Star Crimson amp was, and I don't think it was quite as clinical sounding as the Hegel H590 was, but it was along that line. Very coolish, neutral, not hard, not harsh, not bright, not strident, not fatiguing, but just very cool and very, very true to the source, I think. Um, I think piano is, and this is a common thing, and I don't know if it's the recording, it's the amp, the speakers, I don't know what it is, but a lot of times you get up higher up on the right hand on a piano. It can almost start sound like it's ringing like a bell. And I don't know if that's the body of the piano. I don't know if it's the mic they use. I don't know if it's the room they're in. I don't know if it's the amp, the speakers or whatever. But as you got up way up on the right hand of the piano, you got a little of that ringingness with this. Not as bad as with like the, Arcam or the Cambridge, I mean the uh, uh, Audio Lab, um, but not not lush sounding like the CXA81 or the AXR100. Um, very neutral, but maybe if you had the energy knob and the detail knob, you go up a notch, one notch. Um, so good energy, good detail, very good sense of space and air and room presence and all of that. Excellent, especially on that Academy of Ancient Music recording. Just, you could hear that, that church room, that the space in that church so beautifully, it's just really wonderful. But I, it, it is, there's a little extra energy, but it also, I think it manifests itself more as extra detail um, than just extra energy per se. So anyway, it was excellent on that. Imaging, huge, giant. The triangles could image like a monster. The energy, my energy references can image like few other speakers I've ever heard. And on this amp, both of them just through images, that were room defyingly large, um, high, tall, pinpoint placement, lock, center, lock solid center, depth. Now on the Academy of Ancient Music recording, again, because of the seating arrangement, I'm sure is completely different for recording like that in a church like that, that um, you know the depth of the image is, is gonna be skewed because of that seating arrangement. But what was there was very good and I could hear instruments going all the way back, maybe not as far back as on a traditional orchestral, you know, in a concert hall, but just beautifully rendered, great sense of space. Again, mass strings, they were clean. You could follow individual instruments. It didn't get congested. Um, just very good, very, very fast amplifier, good speed, very effortless delivery, not Hegel effortless, but very close. Um, I mean, a Hegel can do two kilowatts for crying out loud. Um, but very good, very fast, very agile, very nuanced. Um, a, 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 a lot of excellent upper frequency detail. Very, very well done on that. And great imaging, just magnificent imaging. I really, really have enjoyed my time with this thing. And I'm going to be sorry to see it go, but then I'm sorry to see a lot of the stuff I get to play with go. Anyway, so that's the Cambridge Edge A Class XA Integrated Amplifier. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you'd be willing to give me a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to support the channel and buy me a bottle of ibuprofen because of my back hurts, 
there's a thank you button at the bottom of the video window. There's also in the pinned comment and in the video description a membership link if you'd like to join the channel in the video description or Amazon affiliate links. There is no affiliate link for this, um, but Amazon affiliate links, my playlist. Uh, please continue to send me your playlists. Please check out those playlists on the community post. Please comment. Let me know what you think. What kind of amplifiers do you like? What kind of sound do you like? What's your sonic character? I'm kind of the warm, smooth guy, traditionally. Um, and so what's yours? I mean, are, are you hyper detailed? Do you like that Focal kind of B&W, you know, hyper detailed sound? Do you like the kind of the vintage sound, the old advent, you know, large advents or AR sound? Share with it, share with it, share it with me. Again, too much coffee today. Share it with me in the comments. I really appreciate that. And I love the fact that we get to communicate that way too. So Cambridge Edge A. Really a beast. Very, very lovely. Very wonderful piece. Thank you. Like, subscribe, comment, follow me on Instagram if you want. My name's Ed Holmwood. This is the Old Guy Hi-Fi channel. Stay tuned for the continuing saga of Ed's reviewing more integrated amplifiers. There's a couple around here. <laughs> Your obligation right now is to sit back, relax, and listen to some wonderful music, let your blood pressure drop, and just enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for your time. I'm grateful for it. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.